Hello everyone, I'm Jane Pointer, host of AZ Illustrated Science. In this special episode, we explore the connection between Native American cultural practices and health. We'll meet a woman who survived abuse and addiction who's now using traditional Native American practices to help others heal. And we'll talk to a panel of experts about the role culture can play in breaking the cycle of trauma and poor health that plagues Native American communities. That's coming up, but first, we go to the Arizona Public Media Newsroom for today's headlines. Bisbee could make Arizona history tonight if the mayor and council approve an ordinance recognizing same-sex marriage. If that ordinance does pass, Arizona Attorney General Tom Horn says he'll take the town to court because state law explicitly does not recognize same-sex unions. They've named seven statutes that they want to change within the boundaries of Bisbee, and you can't do that. You can pass ordinances that, uh, that pertain to local concerns, but state statutes that deal with statewide concerns can only be changed by the state legislature. Horn was quick to point out that he is not making a judgment on same-sex marriage. If the ordinance passes, Bisbee will be the first municipality in the state to recognize same-sex marriages. In 2003, Tucson officials passed an ordinance recognizing domestic partners. Records from the Tucson Police Department show nearly two dozen officers responded to the University of Arizona last month when a gunman was reported in the administration building. The records obtained by Arizona Public Media show that many of the officers were assigned to keep the area around the administration building clear. However, the records also show that some officers were put on the roof of the student union in sniper positions, and one officer responded with ballistic shields and a mass casualty bag. The report also indicates that the TPD SWAT and gang units responded to the university. The investigation into the incident is continuing. And the command convicted for the 1971 fire at the Pioneer Hotel in downtown Tucson walked free today after taking a plea deal. And that's a look at tonight's headlines. Every week, Sheila Claw Star helps hundreds of people in their recovery from mental health and substance abuse disorders. She does it using the traditional Native American prayers and customs she learned as a child. But her ability to heal others began with her own long journey to recovery. Gisela Tellis brings us Sheila's story, part one of a three-part series on addiction. <laughs> My name is Sheila Clostar, and my mother's side is the Tyron House clan, my father is the Black Sheep clan, my maternal grandfather is the Mini Goats clan, and my paternal grandfather is the Salt clan, and that's who I am as a woman. And I was born in Redlands, California, and was raised in Howell Mesa, Arizona. There, artist Sheila Clostar grew up with her grandmother, a Diné elder who taught her the traditional ways. She would get up really, really early before the sun. She would always be walking from one family to another and visiting them early in the morning and having coffee with them and everything. But when before she went walking, she would, you know, go outside and pray. And that one time I asked her, I said, what are you doing? You know, I was talking to her in Navajo. And I was asking her, what are you doing? And she was saying that she was praying. And then um, she was telling me, this is what you need to do. This is what you need to start doing. This is the bald ego feather. And the smooth side of the feather is the spirit side. And then the rough side of the feather is the education, the knowledge side. Usually, usually when I ask a question, like to my elders, they would say, it just is. <laughs> My first drink was in eighth grade, and that was at school. And I had a friend of mine who brought, you know, whiskey to school, and she wanted somebody to drink with, so I volunteered, and we both got drunk. <laughs> so that was my first experience, and after that, I didn't drink for another probably like two years. Even during high school, I hardly ever drank. You know, I went to parties and stuff, but I hardly ever drank. And, but I did, um, you know, get pregnant at a young age. And 
I ended up with, um, you know, my first husband at the time and had two kids with him. And so after that, you know, we, we stayed together for about nine, almost 10 years. And then after that, that's when I took my second drink again. I was really abused during that time also, you know, being, being married to this person. And um, I just, I guess, couldn't endure it. And then I believed what he said. So um, a lot of those things that I believed what he told me I was, you know, I, I um, drank over all of that. For the first time, I ended up in jail for four days. And when I was in jail, I was ashamed. I felt a lot of guilt. I was scared. I, I felt a lot of pain and hurt, not only for myself, but for my kids. And on the third day, my daughter came, my second oldest daughter, she came to visit me. And um, I couldn't run no more. I couldn't just ignore her. I couldn't just, you know, do what I used to do. I had to sit there and listen to her. So she cried and she said all the things that she wanted to say to me. I just kind of like put all of that together and just finally put it in my heart and decided, you know, I'm not going to drink no more. And that's what I, I just, I just wanted it like that because I didn't want my kids to hurt no more. Sheila came to Tucson to begin her recovery and build a new life. I relied on my tradition. You know, I just used all of that, what my grandmother taught me, my grandfather taught me, you know, and, and what they used to talk to me. And I started really listening to them and what, you know, it was just like I was a child again. And I could just hear their voice, you know, through the wind, you know, and, and I could hear them, you know, being happy and feeling happy. <laughs> As she recovered, she met Ray Matias Sr., a member of the Tohono O'odham Nation, on his own journey of recovery. They talked about the suffering they saw among American Indians in Tucson and how they might be able to help. Good morning, everyone. I wanted to welcome each and every one of you here to the circle. This is a talking circle that we're doing. This I would morning. say about a month or two um, going into all of this. Um, we both had a dream, and, these spirit runners were and um, I dreamed, um, and they were tied, they you know, about Creator and how He needed help. And, they told him and there was a lot of um, people out there that are in need of help, all the way from the children, all the way to, you know, their parents, grandparents. Especially with alcohol. Alcohol is the one that put me down to the bottom. And I couldn't get out. And I knew I needed help to get out. We need to all come back together and come back to our traditions and our culture and our language. You know, all of these things, we started thinking about all of this and how some of it is lost in certain families. And we started thinking and trying to implement some kind of program to kind of tie in all of that together. And so that's how we ended up with that One Sacred Nation healing. I woke up on time, I actually got some sleep, and I beat the sun and I actually watched it come up over the horizon. You know, and then with that... Word feeling, spread about Ray and Sheila's program and demand for their services grew. And then all of a sudden, now the pair serves two to 300 people each week. They volunteer most of their services. We're doing it from our hearts and we, we know what it's like being an alcoholic, being an addict. Traditional practices help people come home to themselves, Sheila says. The question, why am I? Or where am I going? Who am I? And um, not a lot of them, you know, ever sat down and really thought about that for themselves. And so when they do that and they start questioning and they start wanting to learn and they start, you know, I wonder if I have a clan. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. It all comes from the spirit. 
Because if you don't know who you are and where you're coming from, the spirit is unbalanced. And so when they get that knowledge back into them, that's when they mend their spirit. And that's when, you know, the spirit is free again. Showing others the way to freedom has brought Sheila the peace she spent a lifetime chasing. It just changed my life a lot. Um, I, 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 I just can't even describe how, how much it's changed to where, I mean, I just feel free now. I never felt like this before. Not ever in my life. And um, this is what my grandmother and my grandfather taught me. This is where I always hear from them, you know, when I'm in my dream or when I'm outside praying that you are doing a good job because this is where you needed to be all this time. But you're finally here and it's okay. When we return, three experts will join us for a roundtable discussion to explore how culture and trauma interplay in Native American health. The National Rifle Association called for arming and training security officers in every U.S. school. We have back-to-back -back interviews with the author of the NRA proposal and a gun control advocate. Then, as North Korea promises to restart its plutonium reactor, we examine the communist nation's nuclear capabilities. We talk to former Maine Senator Olympia Snow about the future of the Republican Party and the partisan gridlock that prompted her to retire from Congress. We update the Atlanta school cheating scandal as indicted educators begin turning themselves in at the county jail. And poet Gerald Stern reflects on his working class upbringing and 70 years of writing verse in a conversation with Jeffrey Brown. That's all ahead on tonight's News Hour. It seems like there are more travel apps and fewer travel books all the time. Is this an improvement? There's something nice about having a book. You know that someone's actually gone on this journey. You know someone has actually researched and reported all these things. And it does feel like you are being led by someone as opposed to just being led by the wisdom of the crowds. I'm David Green, print versus digital travel guides on the next morning edition from NPR News. Native American communities suffer disproportionately from drug and alcohol abuse, violence and suicide. Addressing this problem has forced scientists to examine how trauma, history and poverty affect health and how culture could help restore it. Here to discuss this complex issue are researcher Tommy K. Begay of the University of Arizona College of Medicine, Natividad Cano, a counselor in the Native Ways Program at the Haven Treatment Facility for Women, and Patricia Gonzalez, UA Assistant Professor of Mexican American Studies and author of Red Medicine, Traditional Indigenous Rites of Birthing and Healing. Well, thank you to all three of you for coming in uh, for this, um, what I'm sure is going to be a fascinating conversation. Tommy, let, let's start with you. Why are the Native American communities so disproportionately high in, in these abuses of drug addiction and suicide rates and that kind of thing? I think, you know, there's uh, what, we, what we've learned through the decades is there's an association to cultural conflict. And what is at the root of the cultural conflict basically is uh, what's referred to as a historical trauma. These are events that have occurred, tragic events actually, where uh, as an example, uh, Native American tribes, Native American people have been placed on, in prison camps that eventually became reservations. And also the concept of the boarding school system uh, for Native Americans, which really the, the, the federal Indian policy at the time, we're talking at the turn of the century, was kill the Indian, save the man, basically, to um, abolish the thinking of the uh, indigenous ways, uh, the indigenous uh, cultures, uh, including the spirituality, the making sense of the world. But, but you're actually measuring the effects, right? You're, you're seeing those very specific effects uh, of this historical trauma. We're beginning to do that now as far as uh, looking at, uh, you know, the impact of stress. But I think, you know, this, there's, there's two components here that we, 
really sort of focus on. One is biology, the other is culture, and culture learned ways of the next generation. And bi biology, or the biological component, includes addiction, includes uh, the impact of uh, chronic diseases as a result of cortisol, or perhaps, uh, uh, you know, the um, cytokines that are released in response to stressful situations. So. And, and Nati, you're, you're now uh, actually taking some of these Native American rituals and practices and, and helping win, women with that. How, how does that program work, the, the Native Ways program? Well, the Native Ways program incorporates and blends Western medicine with traditional healing ceremonies. You know, we have the sweat lodge, we have the uh, smudging ceremony, we have the drumming, we have a talking circle, which really, really helps the women to um, you know, really connect with themselves and connect with each other in, in, a, in a setting that uh, brings um, um, a lot of um, energy to themselves and to the circle itself for the healing. And I'm sure you must have seen some great success stories uh, through this program. G give us a sense of well, some of the things you've seen. Before the Native uh, Waste Program was developed, founded in 2005, uh, the women who would come to treatment would not stay more than 24, more than 23 hours. They would not stay in treatment because they couldn't really connect to the, to the treatment um, modality. And since the Native Waste Program, the retention rate is really high. It's even higher than the general population. We have retention rates or, or completion rates of up to 97% of the women who come. And then the relapse rates are even you know, better than the retention uh, rates. So, so, so just, just so I understand, you're, you're using a lot of what one might think of as sort of traditional ways of, of traditional, um, modern medicine, let's say, ways of, of um, treating abuse and that kind of thing. And it's sort of wrapped around in this cultural um, environment. That's correct. I see. Yes. And, and so, Patricia, in, in your work, um, uh, you, you describe in your book about how um, the uh, indigenous rights and, and the Native American ways can expand on the way mm -hmm. uh, we in Western society think, think about healing. Mm -hmm. Well, I think probably when you said that um, they take science and wrap it around the culture, I think it's culture that wraps, or it's actually blankets then mm -hmm. those Western interventions because culture for indigenous people are the original teachings and those original teachings have evolved over thousands of years as people were created and formed as cultural beings, as human beings. And yet culture is very physiological too. Rituals have a physiological impact on your body, right? And so these ceremonies have a physiological impact on the body. And so there's that very ancient knowledge that, that predates the evolution of Western science as we know it today. There's native knowledge that's its own science that has a lot of culture within it and, and reaches, has a, a totally different understanding of the impact of being able to change the very lives of people, the very vibrations and the energy that, and matter that people comprise that now new science and new physics is starting to try to understand. And there's, that part of that understanding is contained within those ceremonies and within understanding the spirit of the power of a plant and how when it's gathered in ceremony, how it can have actual emotional and spiritual impact on, a hum on the person's body. So then, yeah, tell me. Well, one of the outcomes of historical trauma has been really sort of a disconnect to these ways. And so it is through uh, treatment facilities or through other modes of sort of integrating, uh, coming back to really self-identity and self-esteem and self-empowerment. These are powerful components as far as, you know, reclaiming, you know, a sense of identity, reclaiming a sense of, of a connection as opposed to continuing to use uh, dysfunctional behavioral ways, which might include uh, chemicals, substance, uh, alcohol, drugs, or even the sense of violence, of control. There was, that was the impact of these historically traumatic events, uh, especially the boarding school system. So, so Nati, you, you were nodding your head there. Right, I was thinking about in, in addiction, you know, um, the individual has a, a sense of loss of self, because of the addiction, and then when um, when the women begin to um, acknowledge and recognize and honor the uh, traditional ways, it's a sense of finding self as well. 
So, so how, so, so you, do you see some of these women transform themselves? I, I and see them, I process? see them, yes. It, it's a beautiful thing that happens. It's like, oh my gosh, it's a miracle that happens. And I get to uh, witness that, being there with them. Oh, over this kind happens. of how, how long? I mean, what, what? Obviously, well, it depends on the women. It depends. Women, Sometimes a month. By, by 30 days, I can see a big change. You know, there's a, a, an effect, a facial effect. I can see their eyes, and I can see their smile. I can see their walk, you know, their pride. Their, you know, it's just uh, uh, their hope ab and, about the process of healing with ceremony and healing with traditional ways. Right. Yes. And, and in your, your book, you were also talking about dreams, working with dreams and, and that kind of thing. Give us a sense of that. Well, I think that um, dreams for a lot of Native cultures and peoples uh, is a way that um, it's a way of diagnosing what's happening to that person. Right. And dreams are also embedded. They come out of the culture that you're in. So what's, what's being told to you helps you understand who you are. But dreams, there's all kinds of very um, it, it, in fact, there are dream um, people who only have the role of taking care of dreams. They're so important to a people and their health. And so that's one way, for instance, that we can diagnose um, not only what's happened to them in this time, but even what has happened to them from past experiences across time. But uh, what I wanted to say um, is that dreams help us to understand how Native people have a different concept of the body. And so there are many, many you know, healing systems because each culture has its own traditions. So what Western science and medicine doesn't quite understand is that um, how trauma can impact the body and, and even um, how the spirit can become disconnected and displaced from, from the body and even left at a place where a trauma has happened. And so in a lot of the traditional ways, at least for Mexico and certainly among some of the tribes in the United States, part of the healing has to not only be the talking circles and, and, and a lot of the very important therapeutics that happens in therapy, but also recognizing that that person's spirit may have been left someplace. And so that's what then native knowledge helps us to understand in, in a very specific kind of way. How do we bring that spirit back so they are they're, no, they're actually disconnected from a part of themselves. Okay, so now you're challenging my Western mind yeah. here. What do you mean by I've left? Well, we, you know, somewhere. in psychology, we talk about, dis, uh, what's the disassociation? Disassociation. Right. Disassociation. Right. You know you leave your DNA someplace when you sit on a chair, right? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in ceremony, sometimes people will be taken to that place or their clothes will be taken there and rubbed and there will be prayers said to bring that spirit back to that person. And then other things are ha happen so that the person can come back into integration. So it's a, it's a concept that the Western science doesn't quite recognize yet. And yet that's a, that, um, that belief that a part of your spirit can be left someplace is held by millions of, of um, native peoples, especially peoples who have this connection with pre-Columbian societies. And these ceremonies continue and people will go to these purification ceremonies to, to, to um, help sweep off the negative, the negative feelings and the negative um, kind of the being out of balance. And then their spirit may be called back from that place. And that is an intervention that um, is, is something that, that, that is used. And they may also go to a counselor. Or after they've gone to a counselor, they may go to a person of ceremony because the counseling has brought up all these emotions, right? And of course, we could say there's stress hormones, right? The adrenal system has is, 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 is been excited from the very you know, experience of having to discuss and re-experience a trauma. Uh, but then the traditional healer will help recalibrate them because that ceremony may last two hours, not 15 minutes, not a 30 minute talking session, right? And then, so, so that's then how you can see how that system of knowledge can be used with another system of knowledge to help that person continue on. Well, in, in addition to place, specific place, there are certain ceremonies that sort of, uh, you know, bring us back to our purpose. Again, coming back to self-identity, self-esteem, and self-empowerment. Let's just take, for, for example, the sweat lodge. There are many different indigenous peoples that use sweat lodge in a specific way. Some use water, some use just a dry heat. But basically, in sweat lodge, you return to Mother Earth, and you return to, uh, you know, you, you become an animal like uh, you get down on your on on all fours as you enter the lodge you're entering the womb of mother earth to have you know all the impurities taken out of your impurities in terms of your thinking in terms of your behaving or in terms of your feelings and so that's sort of the symbolically that's represented in the sweat and you come back out into the world a re, reborn individual so that's a sort of coming back to utilizing ceremony in, in terms of reconnecting with again identity in relation to spiritual philosophy and, and symbols, right? So symbols are, are a fairly large part of, of, 
aspect of this. Is that right? Well, symbols is a tricky word. Hmm. <laughs> Why? Know, because what somebody might call a symbol, somebody might say this is a sacred being. Uh huh. Yeah. Expound well, a little on that. Yeah, Nati was talking about smudging, right? And right. and even being in that circle, that circle might be a symbol, but it's a sacred. It's a sacred form, right? And that smudge might be somebody say the sage, but you see it as alive. And when you when you burn it and you pray with it, and it opens up this door to something we can't see, is that a symbol or is it something sacred? You know. So what do you think? Is it, so obviously, I do not have any Native American roots. Mm -hmm. What do you think that I and others like me really don't understand about? you know, the Native American ways and maybe how it impacts uh, the healing that we could all perhaps benefit from even. Well, I think Persicia, you know, started out talking about these are ancient ways. There is an understanding of the universe. There's the understanding of the earth. And as beings, we have responsibilities to take care of the earth, to take care of, uh, you know, our children. To, there, are, there are responsibilities that are sort of dictated in, in the boundaries of, li of living, of, of a lifestyle. And so you subscribe to that lifestyle based upon the spiritual philosophy and it might it might be augmented or changed throughout tribal pe indigenous people throughout the world but basically basically it comes down to sort of my identity and here are the you know what's considered taboo what's considered you know my roles and responsibilities in in order to uh, you know to fulfill you know to bring up, bring upon myself that wellness or that sense of wellness and again you know there have been events in the historically that have happened that have really sort of um, hacked away at that concept to the point where you know individuals might feel disconnected and as a result of that disconnection it's really easy to perhaps seek a, a substance a chemical to bring that or to to numb out from the uncomfortableness of that. So it's important to, you know, again, to come back and reconnect to that to identity, ancient ways of, of, of living, of seeing the world, seeing the universe. So a lot of this sounds like you're really trying to have everybody reconnect with who they are and kind of go deep inside and find themselves again in this context and not try and make themselves part of this Western society. Is, is that part of, of what it is in the last few seconds that we have? I believe it is, and I, I really believe that the individual has that knowledge inside anyway, and, and, and it's there. It's, it was there before, and it's still there, and it's been you know, crushed or with so many layers of so much grief and pain and trauma and addictions and violence that you know, it's just a, a process of finding mm -hmm. that natural um, knowledge, gift, or blessing that it's within the, the individual. Thank you. We need to leave it there. And thank you so much to all three of you for coming in today. Thank you. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed our exploration of Native American health. You can watch any of the segments again and add your own comments at azpm.org. Thanks for joining us.